Give it a minute or two and then I'll start, I think. I think I think maybe maybe now we can get started so we we keep reasonably on on time. All right. Um, hi everybody. Thank you so much for for joining us again for the next set of talks in in this wonderful leading edge series. I'm Jasmine Herodi. I'm currently a postdoc joint between the Rockefeller University in New York and the University of Oxford. And I'll be moving to University of Chicago to start a lab next January. And my co-host today is Alice Corsi, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Sowers Institute for Medical Research and is on the job market this year. So please keep an eye out for her. Um, today, both Alicia and I are really excited to highlight some fantastic work from four really fantastic postdocs that are working in broadly defined evolutionary biology. Uh, we're also super lucky to have a special guest rescheduled talk from the last systems neuroscience session at Clarissa Whitmire. So please do stay to the very end of the session because we have a really action packed schedule. Um, of course, we have Glennis Ogden. Do, do you want to share your slides, Glennis, while I introduce yes. you? Yeah. Great. All right. OK, so our, our first speaker will be Glennis Ogden. She, uh, Glennis did her undergraduate and her PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of Pennsylvania before moving out west to join the University of Washington, where she's currently a postdoctoral research fellow. Her um, excellent work has been recognized by myriad places, including, of course, Leading Edge. Uh, she's a recent NIH K99 Pathway to Independence awardee. She was chosen a rising star in genetics and genomics by the University of Utah. And Glennis is also on the job market this year. And I am so, so, so excited to see all of the groundbreaking work that she's going to undertake as a PI. Um, today, she's going to tell us a little bit about her work probing the structure, sequence, and evolution of human centromeres. Take it away. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for that really kind introduction. So today I'm super excited to tell you about the sequence structure and evolution of human centromeres. I'll start by telling you how I determined the first complete sequence of a human autosomal centromere. And then I'll tell you how I use this sequence, as well as those from other great apes, to reconstruct its evolutionary history over the last 25 million years. So um, in 2003, scientists announced that they had finally completed the sequence of the genome. But about 18 years later, we know that around 8% of the genome wasn't actually resolved. A small portion of this was found within the telomeres, 
our DNA arrays and segmental duplications, but by far the majority of missing sequences were actually found within our centromeres. Centromeres are essential chromosomal regions that mediate the equal and accurate segregation of sister chromatids during mitosis and meiosis. So what are centromeres composed of and why are they so challenging to resolve? Well, if you zoom into the centromere, you can actually see that it's composed of an array of higher order repeats that span somewhere between 300 kilobase pairs and five megabase pairs on any given chromosome. These repeats are typically ordered in a head to tail fashion, but occasionally there will be an inversion or variant that's just a different size. The reason why centromeres are so challenging to resolve is that their repeats are 97 to 100% identical to each other. Additionally, if you look closer at each of these repeats, you can see they actually contain smaller alpha satellite repeats, which are typically 171 base pairs long and ordered in a head to tail fashion. So the reason why centromeres have baffled scientists for the last two decades is because they're composed of repeats of repeats that span megabases on each of our chromosomes. But if we could resolve the centromeres, we know that there would be numerous benefits for the greater scientific and research communities. For example, we could, for the first time, uncover their unique sequence organization. We could define the location of the kinetochore, which is what bridges uh, centromeric chromatin to spindle microtubules during cell division. We could assess their variation in the human population and their role in disease. And we could also determine how they've evolved over time. So how do we resolve the centromeres? Well, the answer is we use long read sequencing. Long reads can traverse complex repeat regions unlike any other sequencing technology. To demonstrate this, I figured I'd show you an example comparing Illumina sequencing to two leaders in the long read sequencing field, PacBio, HiFi, and ONT. So as many of you know, Illumina reads are typically 75 to 250 base pairs long, and they're greater than 99.9% .9 accurate. When you try to map Illumina reads to the centromere, you actually get multiple mapping locations. And that's because Illumina reads are just too short to capture unique sequence variants that allow them to anchor uniquely. However, PacBio HiFi reads, which are 15 to 25 kilobase pairs long and greater than 99% accurate, can map uniquely within the centromeric array. And the reason they can do this is because they contain something known as a singly unique nucleotide camer or a sunk. Sunks are sequences of length K that occur only once in the human genome. So we can map this read to this location because it contains the sunk, which is only found in this region of the genome. However, there are cases when the, the PacBio HiFi reads are too short to contain a sunk. And in these cases, they'll have ambiguous mapping. The last type of technology is actually ONT sequencing. Um, these reads are 10 to over a thousand kilobase pairs long, but they're only 93 to 99% accurate. Despite their lower accuracy, you can absolutely ma map ONT reads within the centromeric region because they're hundreds of kilobase pairs long, and they're able to capture this unique inversion and variant that make up a unique region of the genome unlike anywhere else. So we actually think that PacBio HiFi and ONT sequencing have complementary strengths. PacBio HiFi reads are long reads, but they're greater than 99% accurate, which is almost Illumina level while ONT reads are just super long, hundreds of kilobase pairs long, despite their lower accuracy. So I devised a strategy that combines both PacBio HiFi and ONT long read sequencing to resolve the sequence of the centromeres in the human genome. And it proceeds in six steps. The first step is to generate PacBio HiFi reads. Like I mentioned, these are typically 15 kilobase pairs long and they have greater than 99% accuracy. The second step is to generate ultra-long ONT reads, which are typically over 100 kilobase pairs long, but once again, are 93 to 99% accurate. I then take these ultra-long ONT reads and I barcode them with sunks. To remind you, sunks are those unique camers that only occur once per genome, and combinations of sunks create a unique barcode specific to that region of the genome. You can then take these barcoded ONT reads and basically line them up overlaying the shared barcodes between two reads to create an ONT-based uh, scaffold that completely traverses the centromere. However, because this scaffold is composed of ONT reads, it's only 93 to 99% accurate. So to improve the accuracy of this ONT scaffold, I actually replaced the sequences with PacBio HiFi contigs that I had separately assembled. And this, is, this allowed me to achieve an assembly that's PacBio HiFi based and over 99.9% .9 accurate. 
I then took this assembly and integrated it into a whole chromosome assembly and then validated it with several orthogonal methods. So the first centromere I ever resolved was from chromosome eight. And you can see that um, here, we actually have the first complete structure of an autosomal centromere, which is composed of 2.08 megabase pairs of alpha satellite higher order repeats that are flanked on either side by stretches of monomeric alpha satellite. The monomeric alpha satellite is actually interspersed with lines, LTRs, and signs on the P arm, and gamma satellite lines, LTRs, and signs on the Q arm. Once I had generated this complete map of the centromere, I asked, what does the epigenetic map of this centromere look like? So to answer this question, I actually mapped uh, cytosines within that were either methylated or unmethylated across the entire centromere. And I found that most of the alpha satellite higher order repeats were heavily methylated on their cytosines, except for a small region that was only 73 kilobase pairs long and, and had a complete dip in methylation. I hypothesized that this region might be the site of the mitotic kinetochor. So to test this hypothesis, I performed CHIP-seq against the centromeric histone SEMP-A, which provides that foundation of the kinetochor. And indeed, I found that it perfectly encompassed that dip in methylation, spanning somewhere around 632 kilobase pairs. This region we actually think is the site of the kinetochor. So for the first time, we're seeing the location of kinetochor that we've been studying for decades, but never have been able to map. Once I had generated the genetic and epigenetic map of the centromere, I asked, how has the centromere evolved over time? To answer this question, I took the assembly that I had generated, I fragmented it into five kilobase pair segments, I then aligned each five kilobase pair segment to every other five kilobase pair segment, and then plotted the sequence identity between each pair along the centromere. This generated the first evolutionary map of a human chromosome, uh, human centromere. Um, and you can basically what it is, is a dot plot where every dot represents a sequence identity between two regions in the centromere. And these dots are color coded so that the lower sequence identity is dark purple and the higher sequence identity is dark red. Once I had generated this map, there were really two things that stood out to, to me. The first is this mirror symmetry of the centromere. You can practically mirror the symmetry or the centromere over the central axis of the centromere. The second thing that stood out to me was this layered nature of the centromere. We can distinguish five distinct evolutionary layers of the chromosome 8 centromere. The oldest and most ancient layer is actually present in the monomeric alpha satellite on the P and the Q arms, which have sequence identity to each other, but no sequence identity to the rest of the alpha satellite higher order repeats. The second most ancient layer is this one here, which is really the transition region between monomeric and higher order repeat alpha satellites. Once again, these regions share sequence identity to each other, but have very low sequence identity to the rest of the centromere. And then the third layer is this one represented here, which is on the edge of the, each of the higher order repeat arrays. And then the fourth layer is here. And then the fifth layer is this highly identical um, stretch of repeats within the core of the centromere. This mirror symmetry and layered nature of the centromere actually reminded me of, um, of a paper I had once read by George Smith in 1976 who proposed that young repeats are actually born within the core of the centromere. And as they emerge, they push these older and more divergent repeats to the edges, which creates this mirror symmetry and layered nature that we see here. To really reconstruct the evolution of the centromere, I actually turned to the primate phylogeny, which consists of human, chimpanzees, gorilla, orangutan, gibbon, and macaque, separated by at least 25 million years of evolution. I generated PacBio, HiFi, and ONT data from the chimpanzee, orangutan, and macaque genomes, and then I separately assembled each of their chromosome 8 centromeres to see how they compare and have evolved over time. So I wanted to take a moment to go through each of these centromeres. So the first is the chimpanzee centromere. This one um, is very similar to the human centromere. It's 2.28 megabase pairs long, which is very similar to the 2.08 megabase pair um, higher order repeat array that we had seen in the human case. Once again, this centromere had that mirror symmetry and layered nature that we had observed with the human one. The orangutan centromere was larger. It was twice the size of the human and the chimp ones at 4.04 megabase pairs long. And once again, it had that mirror symmetry and layered nature we had seen with the other two centromeres. However, there was something unique. For the first time, we could see the emergence of two distinct higher order repeat regions um, that we actually think are fighting for dominance. Because this one on the left actually has a higher sequence identity than the one on the right, 
we think that this one is more recently emerged and probably is expanding and will push this, um, the one on the right, towards the edge as it takes over. And then the last one we assembled was the macaque chromosome 8 centromere, which was a whopping 10.92 megabase pairs long, and which is about five times the size of the human in the chimp one. This one is uh, distinct because it's composed of alpha satellite dimers as opposed to higher order repeats. But despite that, it still had that mirror, mirror symmetry and layered nature we had seen with the other primate centromeres. So after I had assembled all of these centromeres, I decided to extract all the alpha satellite monomers and build a phylogenetic tree to understand their evolutionary, evolutionary relationships. I found that the alpha satellite monomers clustered into five distinct clades. So the one at the top is composed of great ape higher order alpha satellite. And you can see that all these monomers come from this higher, this higher order repeat array within the great ape chromosome 8 centromeres. The second one is actually the great ape monomeric alpha satellite, which comes from both the P and the Q arms on all the great ape centromeres. The third and the fourth actually come from the macaque centromere by itself. Um, and this is composed of monomeric and dimeric alpha satellite. Interestingly, some of these alpha satellite are more evolutionarily related to the great apes, while as the other set is um, about 25 years uh, diverged, or 25 million years diverged from the great apes, which you can see down at the bottom of this tree. And the fifth clade, which is perhaps the most interesting one, is this human and chimpanzee monomeric alpha satellite, which comes from this Q arm on only the human and chimp uh, centromeres which we think is actually the vestigial centromere that has uh, been retained from the human, um, sorry, great ape and old one monkey split 25 million years ago. We could also uh, begin to estimate the centromere mutation rate for the first time. So to do this, we took all of these assemblies and then we uh, extracted 10 KB segments and then did a multiple sequence alignment and then estimated the sequence divergence from human. And you can see as the sequence progresses from unique into monomeric, the, the divergence also increases in the chimp and the orangutan and the human. And, you, and this increase in mutation rate allowed us to calculate an estimated minimum for the mutation rate, which we think it's a mutating at least 2.2 to 3.8 fold faster than the rest of the human genome. So in conclusion, I developed a new targeted assembly method that leverages the strength of PacBio HiFi and ONT data to resolve the sequence of multiple centromeres in primates. I also established an evolutionary model that explains the mirrored and layered nature of the centromere. In the future, I plan to determine how centromeres vary among the human population, looking at both their genetic and epigenetic variation. And I'd also like to reconstruct the evolutionary history of all centromeres by sequencing and assembling each centromere in diverse humans and apes. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, the Eichler Lab and Telomere to Telomere Consortium and other collaborators who contributed to this project, as well as my uh, funding sources and, of course, the Leading Edge Symposium, um, which has given me the opportunity to present my work today. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Glennis. I see Kara has her hand up. So let's let's lead in with her question. Hey, Kara. Hey, Glennis. That was so cool. Um, oh, thanks. That was awesome. I have a senpai question, um, yeah. and I, I think it relates to what you were hinting at at the end there, which is the human to human variation. I'm wondering if you have any information on this senpai location between individuals and whether that moves. I do. Um, so I've since I've published this work, I've begun to assemble all the centromeres in a second human genome, and I've also mapped the location of Sempe. And what I see is that in some centromeres, it's in a very similar location, and in others, it's shifted by at least a megabase or two megabases um, upstream or downstream. So it's absolutely variable in position among humans. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have one more question in the chat. Oh, we have a couple of questions in the chat. I will just to ask one of them for the for the sake of time. Um, Alice asks, uh, you mentioned one of the centromeres is much larger than the human one. Do you think that relates to some additional function? Mm, I think it might be more, uh, a, you know, a consequence of its evolution over time. We found that more ancient genomes seem to have greater uh, uh, alpha satellite higher order repeat arrays. So I think they just have had more time to expand over time. Um, it's possible that the size of the higher order repeat array actually affects the amount of sempe chromatin that can be assembled onto that array, which might in turn affect the size of the kinetic core. So it's very, very possible that larger higher order repeat arrays result in greater sized kinetic cores that are being, will have less likely to be uh, missegregated during mitosis and meiosis. Thank you. 
Awesome, thank you. Um, if anybody else has any more questions for Glennis, please put them in the chat and I'm sure she will be happy to, to field them later. But for now, let's just give her one more round of applause and we will move on to our next speaker who is uh, Lisa Kersal. Lisa, do you want to share your slides? Yeah, let's see. Wonderful. All right. <laughs> Next up, we have uh, Lisa herself. Uh, Lisa got her bachelor's in biology and, and music performance at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and her PhD in cellular and molecular biology at the University of Washington and uh, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. She's now a postdoctoral research scientist at the, the University of Utah. Um, Lisa is both a skilled bench scientist and an experiment, uh, experienced bioinformatician. And this broad, broad background that spans molecular biology and genome evolution is what drives her like, really, really impressive integrative approach to, to research. And we're so thrilled to, to have her be part of our symposium today. And I will pass on the mic now to, to Lisa, who is going to tell us about her work on the molecular evolution of meiotic proteins. Hey, great. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I will jump right in. Uh, so my work um, focuses broadly on meiosis, and meiosis is the specialized cell division that produces gametes, so eggs, sperm, and spores, um, and it requires that a diploid progenitor cell replicates its chromosomes once and divides twice to produce haploid gamete. And this is a key step for genome inheritance and sexual reproduction. And it's easy to take this um, textbook definition of meiosis for granted, but we shouldn't. Um, because in humans, there's actually um, genome inheritance is quite inefficient, and 35% of zygotes have an incomplete chromosome set, meaning that they have either too many or too few chromosomes and are um, aneuploid. So the broad goal of my research is to understand um, the molecular mechanisms underlying chromosome dynamics in the germline, and in doing so, better understand defects that can lead to infertility, aneuploidy, and disease. Um, and I do use a variety of approaches to address this, but fundamentally, um, my research involves um, an evolutionary lens. And I'll give you examples of what I mean by this when I talk about my postdoctoral research. But first, um, I wanna talk about meiotic chromosome dynamics. And a point I wanna emphasize is that chromosomes are not just compact pieces of DNA. They're actually highly um, regulated entities that undergo really dramatic changes during meiosis. So when meiosis begins, chromosomes go from being um, these blobs in the nucleus to discrete elongated structures. And homologous chromosomes, so the chromosome from uh, mom and the chromosome from dad, need to find their partner, and they get zipped together by a structure called the synaptonemal complex. So meanwhile, chromosomes are bombarded with double-stranded DNA breaks, um, some of which are repaired as crossovers, where entire chromosome arms are actually um, exchanged between homologs. And these are the main chromosomal events during meiotic prophase. Then chromosomes are ready for meiotic division. And here chromosomes need to segregate twice without an intervening round of DNA replication. So the homologous chromosomes separate first in the um, me meiosis one division and sister chromatids separate um, in meiosis two. So what I have depicted here is actually um, male meiosis where um, <laughs> the four meiotic products go on to become gametes, but the chromosome dynamics don't end with the meiotic divisions. Um, so sperm are often compacted, um, highly compacted, sometimes up to 200 fold, and um, undergo a wide scale exchange of the chromatin packaging proteins um, from histones to proteins called protamines. Female meiosis presents other unique challenges for chromosomes. Um, in female meiosis, only one of the four meiotic products is passed on to the next generation in the egg. And this sets up an opportunity for chromosomes to compete for inclusion um, in the egg in a process known as meiotic drive. So my research has um, focused on several aspects of these chromosome dynamics for my PhD and my postdoc work. And in my PhD, um, I uncovered specialized roles for centromeric proteins in meiosis, and we just heard a lot about centromeres from um, Glennis's beautiful talk just before mine. Um, but to remind you, the centromere is the region of the chromosome that 
attaches to the spindle during mitosis and meiosis, and is divine, defined by a specialized histone variant called SENH3, or also known as SEMP-A. Um, and I found that evolu uh, over evolutionary time, SENH3 has undergone recurrent gene duplication and specialization, such that there's one version of SENH3 for male meiosis and one version for female meiosis. And I hypothesize that this um, specialization is actually selected for due to the different chromosomal gymnastics that happen in male versus female meiosis. So now during my postdoc, my research focuses on um, the synaptonemal complex, which I have cartooned here in pink. And that is what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of my time today. So um, to remind you, the, or to tell you, the two main functions of the synaptonemal complex or the SC are to um, align homologous chromosomes and to regulate the number and distribution of crossover events. And these functions are conserved in all major eukaryotic clades and are um, essential for sexual reproduction. So not only is the function of the SC conserved, so is its ultrastructure. And this is an electron micrograph of the SC and nematodes. And you can see it has this um, ladder-like structure. And here's a few more examples of the SC from a mouse and a beetle. And what's really striking is that not only is the overall ultrastructure conserved, but so is the width and dimension of the SC, which is 100 nanometers in these diverge, um, divergent species. And in organisms where the SC proteins have identified, been identified, at least one protein assembles um, into a stereotypical transverse filament orientation, um, which spans the 100 nanometer distance across the SC with its N terminus pointing towards the center um, and the C terminus pointing away. So I've told you that the SC has conserved function and a conserved structure. Um, and even conserved orientation of some of its components. So it's really surprising then that a third feature of the SC is that the proteins themselves are um, very, very diverged. And this is so much so that SC proteins have been identified independently in nearly all model organisms. So in my postdoctoral research, I asked um, the following questions. What are the rules for SC protein evolution? What are conserved features of SC proteins? And I think what I've learned um, in, in investigating these questions can help inform structure function relationships in the synaptonemal complex. So the system that I work in um, for my postdoc is C. elegans um, and center of Ditis broadly. And in C. elegans, there are six synaptonemal complex proteins called CYP1 through CYP6. The transverse filament proteins are CYP1, 5, and 6. And like in other organisms, the SC proteins are interdependent for their function. So a null in one protein um, generally results in the loss of the entire complex. Okay, so decif to decipher the rule for SC protein evolution, I took a close look um, specifically at the evolution of these um, five synaptonemal complex proteins in the genus Center of Ditis, and I compared features of conservation and divergence between the SC proteins and between um, the rest of the proteome in about 30 species of Center of Ditis, which share um, a common ancestor over 100 million years ago, and so actually represent a really broad um, swath of evolutionary time. So I uncovered three main rules, and the first is that SC proteins are indeed significantly more diverged than other proteins in center of ditis. And I did this by calculating the amino acid substitutions per site for the entire proteome and comparing that to the SC proteins, which are significant, have a significantly higher rate of amino acid substitutions. The second rule I uncovered is that SC proteins have conserved coiled-coil domains. So a coiled-coil is a protein fold that consists of two alpha helices wrapped around one another in a supercoil. And as they can be predicted bioinformatically, and SC proteins are indeed predicted to contain coiled coils. And within the SC, we don't exactly know the function of the coiled coils, but they could be involved in facilitating oligomerization of the complex or playing a role in this molecular spacer function, determining that 100 nanometer width. But importantly, a coiled coil repeat is um, defined by a repeating seven amino acid um, pattern that where the, the requirements are that the first and the fourth amino acid are hydrophobic and the fifth and the seventh are polar or charged. Then when the protein folds into a helix, um, it can the two coils can interact through a hydrophobic core and electrostatic interactions. <clears throat> 
So you can predict the coil coil of a single protein, and here's what that looks like. This is for C. elegans CYP1 protein, and a high score means likely to be a coil coil, which I've cartooned here in these gray ovals. But what I wanted to know is if this domain was conserved. So for CYP1 and for all of the SC proteins um, in center of I um, aligned the coiled coiled scores from all species. So all the individual species here are in gray and the average is in this pink yellow line. And you can see that this coil, these two coiled coiled domains are highly conserved with really sharp boundaries. Um, even this conserved interruption in the domain um, and interestingly, this domain is not apparent at all looking at um, percent identity of the primary sequence. So without this type of analysis, we would not be able to see this conserved structure. And I developed a way to quantify this conservation to compare the SC proteins to the rest of the proteome. And I found that indeed SC proteins have significant, significantly more conserved coiled coiled domains than other coiled coiled proteins in center of ditis. So the third feature that I found is that the length of the SC proteins is conserved. Um, and this could be due to the, the fact that the 100 nanometer width is conserved and others have found that um, changing the length of the transverse filament coiled coiled domains impacts the overall width of the SC. Um, and the comparison I did was looking at coefficient of variation of protein length for SC proteins compared to the rest of the proteome, and they indeed have lower length variation. So I thought these three features of SC protein evolution combined um, made the SC proteins actually really unique. So I looked at them simultaneously and compared again to the rest of the proteome. So now we're looking at amino acid substitutions per site, coefficient of variation in protein length and the coil coil conservation score. And you can see that the SC proteins are peripheral to the main cluster of proteins in center of ditis. So I wondered whether other clades, um, the SC proteins from other clades shared this same pattern. So I compared um, the pattern in center of ditis to Drosophila and to mammals. And I'll show you the Drosophila data here. So again, I did the same analysis for um, Drosophila, the genus Drosophila, and found that the three known SC proteins in Drosophila reside in the same position of the plot as in center of ditis. And that's despite the fact that they have no identifiable sequence homology between SC proteins. So this signature was so strong that I thought we could use it to actually predict SC proteins in um, genomes where they weren't already known. So I turned to another um, nematode genus, the genus Pristianchus. And um, Pristianchus is distantly related to center of ditis, um, but within the genus Pristianchus, there's the model organism Pristianchus pacificus, which you can grow in lab and has um, the ability to be genetically modified. So one SC protein had been identified in Pristianchus pacificus called CYP4, um, but we reasoned that there would likely be other CYP proteins to identify. So I did the same analysis in Pristianchus, came up with a list of candidates, which um, gratifyingly included Pristianchus CYP4, the previously identified CYP protein, um, but also I found a new CYP protein, Pristianchus CYP1. So to verify that this was indeed a synaptonemal complex protein, um, I made a knockout in Pristianchus pacificus, and I saw that the knockout has essentially no viable self progeny. Um, and when I looked at the chromosomes of meta at metaphase of meiosis one, the wild type uh, Pristianchus has six paired bivalents, but the synaptonemal complex mutant has 12 unpaired univalents. I also made tagged versions of Pristianchus CYP1 and found that it localized to the interface between homologous chromosomes. And I investigated whether Pristianchus CYP1 was a transverse filament protein by tagging, um, differentially tagging the N and the C terminus with either an HA or an OLAS tag and performing um, super resolution microscopy using STED to localize the two termini relative to one another. And I found that the C terminus forms these parallel tracks which I measured as being um, 114 nanometers apart, and the N-terminus forms just a single track um, between the two C termini. So this confirms that it is indeed the transverse filament protein and matches nicely this approximately 100 nanometer width of the SC. Okay, so I think we can provide a bit of resolution to this paradox. Um, instead of thinking about primary sequence conservation, 
um, think about conservation of secondary structure. And in this case, that would be coil coil domains and the protein length. And just to reiterate, this evolutionary signature was so strong that it allowed me to identify a new SC protein that has no sequence similarity to any other um, known SC protein. So I'm also really interested in what this evolutionary signature can tell us about important structural features of the SC. Um, and that's what I'm currently working on. And I have two specific avenues of research along those lines. So one is the importance of um, the length of the coil coil domain versus the sequence. So I'm swapping uh, regions, coil coil domain segments with segments from other species and also with synth synthetic coil coil domains to test whether um, really, you, maybe you only need a coiled coil domain of some length to, to um, have a functional SC protein. And then another um, area I'm interested in, in pursuing and following up on now is investigating the function of these coiled coil disruptions, which I've only shown you in, in SIP1, but other uh, SC proteins from center of ditis have these same highly conserved disruptions. And so we're making mutations in those to see how they affect the function of the SC. So I wanna say thank you to um, the entire ROG lab, my mentor, Ofer, and especially to Henry and Jesus, who is a technician and an undergrad that um, works with me, to my funding and to the leading edge um, for this opportunity to speak and to all of you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Lisa, that was amazing. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can uh, toss them in the chat. We are actually running a little behind, um, but let me just ask a, a really uh, quick question and then anybody else just uh, throw it in the chat and you can field them later. Um, I, I was just wondering what you think the kind of evolutionary purpose is of, of this particular way of, of uh, con conservation, like having a higher mutation rate but preserving the secondary structure. Yeah, so one um, invest or one one area I investigated that I didn't talk about is whether the SC proteins evolve under what's called positive selection, which could indicate some sort of genetic evolutionary arms race. Um, in this case, I which which could be a possibility for a meiotic protein um, with a high rate of evolution. But in this case, I don't detect any evidence for positive selection, so I don't think it's an arms race scenario. And I think really. Um, the high mutation rate is due to the fact that the key structure is the coil coil, which has these somewhat loose requirements of polar amino or yeah, polar or charged amino acids at five and seven and hydrophobic at one and four. So kind of as long as you meet those requirements, the, the specific sequence could vary. Do you, do you see a similar signature in other coil coil proteins? So actually, um, I, that's an interesting question. In general, coiled coil domains are highly conserved, but I think that likely has to do with the fact that they, are all, they often are involved in other protein-protein interactions. Um, so there are other, others have hypothesized that coiled coil domains that are not highly conserved perhaps function more as this molecular ruler um, without a ton of other protein protein interactions on top of them. But I haven't um, broadly investigated other coil coils myself. Cool. Thank you. Um, there are some questions for you in the chat, so feel field them at your at your leisure. Uh, I will now hand off the mic to Alice, who will introduce our final two speakers. Thank you so much, Jasmina. This was such a uh, blast. <laughs> Thank you uh, for the first two speakers. Uh, you guys did a really uh, great work. So now we can move on. Uh, and our third speaker today is uh, Zoe Hilbert. Uh, Zoe obtained her PhD at the MIT, and now uh, she is a postdoc uh, at the University of Utah. Zoe uh, is a Helen Hay Whitney Fellow, and she's going to be on the job market this year. So keep an eye on uh, her applications. And uh, she has a very cool story today to share with us uh, about the modalities uh, uh, of post pathogen uh, uh, interactions and uh, how they are shaping each other. Uh, so uh, please, uh, Zoe, take it away. Great, awesome. So can everyone see my screen and hear me? Hopefully, yep, yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Great, um, right, so I'm super excited to be here today to tell you about the research program I've been building, uh, studying new modalities in host pathogen arms races. 
But more specifically today, um, I'll be telling you a, a smaller story that I've been working on for the last couple of years, studying uh, host adaptation in a human fungal pathogen. And so my interests really lie at studying the evolution that's happening at the host microbe interface, and in particular in trying to understand how these interactions can drive the acquisition of, kind of new evolutionary innovation in all species involved. And so when I started my postdoc, I really wanted to try to apply this lens in particular to the study of host fungal interactions. And when I started to think about this, I really quickly became totally fascinated by the question of how fungal pathogens, which are primarily derived from environmental sources, evolve the ability to be able to infect mammalian hosts in the first place. And one really common hypothesis that gets put forward all the time to explain this is diagrammed here, and that's that these environmental fungi are trained through interactions with predators that they encounter in their, their environment, such as these amoeba, and that leads to these populations that are then poised to be able to infect mammals. Of course, we know the evolution doesn't stop there, and so once these fungi get into mammalian hosts, they can also experience repeated interactions with host immune cells, such as macrophages, and these interactions can also select for adaptations in the fungal population, which can have really important consequences for disease progression and outcomes. And so what I wanted to try to do was to ask whether we could provoke this sort of evolution of a fungal pathogen in the lab and build a system where we could start to ask questions about how different host species might differentially shape the evolutionary trajectories of these fungi. And so the idea I had was to take environmental strains of fungal pathogens, expose them to phagocytes from different host species, and allow them to interact for defined periods of time, after which we could lice off the host cells and collect only the fungi. I can freeze down aliquots of these fungal cells, which creates a fossil record and facilitates evolutionary studies, and then use the remaining population to repeat this process over and over again and see what we get out. Now, before I show you any of the data uh, from this experimental evolution system, I first want to introduce you to the players I'll be talking about today, and we'll start first with these host cells. So as I've already alluded to, all of the work I'll be showing you was actually done in parallel in both amoeba as well as in macrophages. On the left here, you're seeing an image of the particular amoeba species that I work with called Acanthamoeba castellanii. Here it's shown interacting with fungal cells and its media. And the particular strain that I'm working with was actually isolated as a contaminant from a culture of wild yeasts from the environment. It's also quite abundant in the environment. And so uh, together we think this suggests that this is an ecologically relevant predator of many different species of fungi. On the right, you're seeing an image of the J774A cell line. This is a mouse macrophage-like cell line that will serve as the macrophage model for all of this work. So those are our host cells. What about our, our fungi? And for this, I've decided to use the human fungal pathogen Cryptococcus neoformans. Cryptococcus is an encapsulated yeast, as you can see here, and it's a member of the Spacidiomycete group of fungi, which means that it's actually quite evolutionarily distinct from many of uh, our other kind of favorite laboratory model fungi. Cryptococcus is a primary cause of mortality in HIV and AIDS patients, and it has a particular tropism for the brain, so it can cause a, a fatal cryptococcal meningitis in these patients. Now, really importantly, given my interest in trying to understand how fungi go from the environment into the clinic, Cryptococcus was also a really ideal choice because there's been a lot of sampling of strains from both clinical and environmental sources. And so I'm showing you here a phylogeny of roughly 35 Cryptococcus isolates that were sent to us by John Perfect's lab at Duke. But this is really just a small subset of the hundreds of strains that have been collected and made really readily available to the community. And so this extensive sampling provides us with this incredibly rich resource and a whole lot of genetic variation, which I think is really ideal for, for doing these sorts of evolutionary studies. So the first thing that I did when we got all of these strains into the lab was I, I started to ask how well they're able to replicate either in macrophages or in amoeba to try to identify strain-specific differences in these phenotypes. But in the interest of time today, I'm just going to focus on a single strain indicated here called FTC555-1. This is an environmental isolate, and it served as the starting strain for my experimental evolution. So uh, basically, all of the data that I'll show you today uh, came from experiments that look something like this, where I take a cryptococcus strain of interest, I put it into culture either with macrophages or amoeba, 
and I allow the crypto to be phagocyte host over the course of one hour. At the end of that time, I remove all of the extracellular yeast and replace the media with fresh media, and let everything grow together for an additional 24 hours. And at that point, I lyse the host cells, collect all of the fungus and plate it so that I can count CFUs. Importantly, I also play a series of control after this initial phagocytosis step, which gives me an input CFU count. And so I used experiments like this to determine the starting phenotype of the FTC 555-1 strain and uh, the data I'm showing you here on the right. So starting first with how well this strain is able to replicate in macrophages. On the y-axis here, I've plotted the log two of the CFU fold change that's over that 24 hour replication period. The solid bar here indicates how well this strain grows in the absence of macrophages, but under identical culture conditions. So this isn't tissue culture media. The stripe bar here indicates what happens when I add in those macrophage cells. And so for this particular strain, you can see this kind of interesting phenotype where it actually dies in tissue culture media. But when you add in those macrophage cells, this restores its ability to replicate a little bit. So it actually prefers to replicate inside of macrophages. We can look at the data for the amoeba experiments in the same way. So again, the solid bar here indicates how well the strain grows in just media. And the stripe bar is when we add in those amoeba. And so you can immediately appreciate that the amoeba are much better at killing this strain. And I would say that is generally true for all of the strains that I've looked at so far. Okay, so that was our starting phenotype. And so what I did was I took uh, this strain and I threw it into the serial passaging regime using a, a, a setup very similar to what you've seen on previous slides. And I did this passaging for a total of 12 rounds and evolved six independent populations. Three of these I passaged through macrophages and three I passaged through amoeba. Okay, so what sorts of phenotypes do we get out of this? Looking first at how well these evolved strains uh, are able to replicate in our amoeba system, I'm reminding you here on the left in teal of our parental starting phenotype. And if you want to focus on one bar, just focus on the striped bar here. Um, and so first we looked at strains that were passaged through amoeba shown down here in shades of green. And I was really very excited to see that in two of the three independent lines, I have this enhanced ability uh, of these strains to replicate inside of amoeba. And so this is particularly pronounced for this A1 strain here in the darkest shade. In contrast, if I look at strains that were instead passaged through macrophages shown in shades of blue, we see uh, very little change in their ability to replicate in the amoeba system. And if anything, they might've gotten a little bit worse. I can look at the same evolved strains and see how well they're able to replicate now in macrophages. Again, reminding you of the starting phenotype here on the left. This time we'll look first at the strains that were passaged through macrophages. And I was super excited to see that again in two of these three independent uh, populations, I have this enhanced ability to replicate inside of macrophage cells. Interestingly, when I look at uh, the strains that are instead passaged through amoeba, there's really no change in their ability to replicate inside of macrophages. And so what that tells us is that in this particular evolution, the amoeba really didn't select for any traits that are beneficial for growth inside of macrophages and vice versa. And instead, what I've done is really efficiently host adapted these strains to the host cells that they were passaged through. This, of course, is still really interesting and lets us ask questions about how these hosts are selecting for different changes in these populations. And so in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to tell you what we've found about uh, the, the genetic uh, underpinnings of, of what we see in this particular strain here called M1, which is a macrophage passage strain that has this really robust enhanced ability to replicate inside of macrophages at the end of the evolution. And so what I did was I took a number of single colonies as well as a pooled culture from the end of my evolution experiment for this strain. And I sent it out for sequencing. And when I got the data back, there was only a single mutation that was fixed in all of these samples. And that mutation is a missense mutation that falls into a gene called CAC1. CAC1 in Cryptococcus uh, encodes the adenylate cyclase, which of course is the central regulator of the cyclic AMP signaling cascade. And in Cryptococcus, uh, this cyclic AMP signaling is responsible for regulating many aspects of its biology, and in particular, many aspects of its biology that are super important for contributing to its, its virulence and its ability to ca cause disease. So these include things like capsule and melanin production, as well as cell size. Um, so already this kind of pointed or really strongly suggested that this was probably our causative mutation in this strain. 
but I wanted to confirm this experimentally. And so what I did was I took uh, the parental strain and I introduced this evolved cap one allele, this single mutation um, at the endogenous locus. And what I found was that in two independent isolates, uh, this conferred this enhanced ability to replicate in macrophages and very much phenocopies the evolved strain that we recovered from the evolution. I can also do the reciprocal swap and take the uh, evolved strain and put back in the parental allele of CAC1. And when I do this, this uh, uh, abrogates the ability of the strain to replicate in macrophages back down to the parental uh, level. And so this really suggests that this CAC1 mutation is what's underlying the phenotype that we're seeing in this M1 strain. So I've done a lot more work on this uh, that I don't have time to show you today, but I'll just leave you with one last piece of data, which is that I went back uh, through my uh, fossil record and sequenced all of those pools to try to map the, the trajectory of this mutation over time. And so what I'm showing you here on the y-axis is the allele frequency of that CAC1 evolved allele, that single mutation over the course of all of my passages. And so what you can see is that this uh, mutation arose uh, really early in the fourth passage and then very quickly swept through the population. And so that suggests to us that this mutation really confers a strong selective advantage for growth inside of macrophages. Okay, so to wrap up, I've told you today how I've built this system to uh, serially passage a fungal pathogen through different types of host cells to ask questions about how these different hosts might shape the evolution of these, these fungi. And so we've seen that the serial passaging can select for cryptococcus populations with enhanced survival within these different types of host phagocytes. I've also shown you how we've started to dive into um, what's underlying these phenotypes that we recover and how we've seen that there's a mutation in the adenylate cyclase gene that can confer enhanced growth in macrophages. And I can also kind of watch this over time using that fossil record and see when and how quickly these mutations sweep through populations. Moving forward, there's still work to do on this particular story. Um, I'd really like to get down to the mechanism that underlies how this CAC1 mutation confers that enhanced growth phenotype. I'm also super interested in how the host response might differ when exposed to the evolved versus parental strains. And then zooming out a little bit, my future research program will really uh, focus on trying to define the rules of engagement for how different hosts interact with the pathogens that infect them. And so these sorts of evolutionary approaches have really so far focused primarily on viruses and bacterial pathogens, and I think there's still a lot of really exciting work to do there. But in my lab, I'll really be focusing this on uh, the study of host fungal interactions. And so I've already told you about this experimental evolution, and I'm really excited to keep exploring this and try to reveal new and exciting biology on the fungal side. Uh, but I've also spent quite a lot of time looking at uh, interesting signals of rapid evolution in host C-type lectin receptors and other uh, immune receptors that are involved in detecting pathogenic fungi in mammals. And so in my, my future lab, hopefully, um, we will also focus on how these signals contribute functionally to how well mammalian immune systems are able to recognize and respond to fungal invaders. And so with that, I'll just thank my PI, Nels, um, as well as Mara Shuiso, a really talented technician in the LD lab who's been helping me for the last year. The rest of the LD lab, my collaborators at Duke and here at Utah, uh, my funding sources and the leading edge community for being a really fantastic source of support and inspiration over the last couple of years. And thank you. Great, uh, great talk, Adoy. That was that was amazing. Uh, okay, if anybody has questions, uh, you can raise your hand or like write that in the chat. We already have one question from Jeanette. Uh, so great talk, Zoe. Uh, if you pre-activate the macrophages, for example, with LPS or Zymosana, does that alter their ability to kill the non-evolved E strains? Might that make a better or at least interesting background for your in vitro evolution? Yeah, so this is a great question, and I left out some of the experimental details here. So I do actually pre-activate my macrophages before I do this, um, but there have been some differences reported in the way that you do this. And so I think exploring other activation uh, kind of regimes might change the evolution in interesting ways. And I think it would also be really interesting if we could kill the crypto a little bit more with the macrophages. That would definitely exert a much stronger selective pressure. So. Yeah, it's a great question. Great, that sounds great. 
Uh, you have one more question in the chat, but because of time, we will move maybe to the next talk. So if you can maybe like reply in the chat, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now we can move on to uh, Emily. Emily, if you want yeah, to start sharing your slides. So our uh, next speaker is uh, Emily Hager. Emily obtained her PhD at Harvard with the Hopi Orchestra. And uh, now she's a postdoc at the Boston University. Emily will tell us uh, about how she's using uh, cellular slime molds uh, to study how multicellular behaviors uh, are shaped uh, by the interactions between cells and the environment. And you will see this is a very cool system. So Emily, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Great. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here and to have the opportunity to share some of the early results from my postdoctoral work. So something that's really fascinating to me in biology is that across a wide range of systems, local interactions between individual organisms and cells can wind up generating much larger scale patterns and behaviors, things that take place over much larger scales than the individual sensory domain of any particular individual. Um, and we see this across a huge number of systems, ranging from these sort of animal systems of fish shoaling and schooling or ants that create these very complex foraging networks by interacting with each other, um, and also at much smaller scales. So for example, cells that collectively migrate um, across different tissues in the body over very large distances, or these single-celled amoeba that communicate across large distances to create these multicellular structures. And something that I think is really important and interesting is that in a lot of these cases, these kinds of behaviors take place in really complex, heterogeneous uh, environments that can also be dynamic in time. So for example, fish will shoal and school near coral reefs or in highly structured kelp forests. Um, these ants sometimes forage on what you can almost think of as a net of twigs and branches. Um, these cells that migrate long distances encounter spaces that vary a lot in their stiffness, their sort of volume characteristics and um, chemically as well. And this classic example, cellular slime molds actually do this aggregation behavior in highly complex soil and dung-like environments. And understanding um, the impact of that environment where these behaviors take place, I think can be really important um, because those environmental shape, uh, features will shape both local interactions among individuals and the global outcomes. Um, those features will shape things like which individuals can communicate with each other, how information transmits through the space between individuals, as well as what behavioral responses are available, for example, where a cell can go in the space. And of course, layered on top of that, um, there's potentially interesting variation among organisms that live in different environments in how they solve these problems. So in my postdoctoral work, I'm really interested in trying to address some of these bigger picture questions about how these large scale behaviors are shaped by this kind of environmental complexity and also how they're robust to this kind of variation um, because we know they perform these behaviors robustly in their natural environment all the time. And to me, one of the most challenging aspects of trying to address these questions is that the more complex you make the environment, the more difficult it is even to observe the behavior you're interested in, um, let alone try to quantify it in some way or understand what's going on. And so what I'm gonna tell you about today is a system I've developed to allow us to sort of get a look at some of these questions in a classic case of um, microbial coordinated behavior. And those are the cellular slime molds. Uh, so these are usually single-celled amoeba that live in the dirt eating bacteria. But when they run out of food, and if there are enough of them around, they initiate this multicellular development process that allows them to gather into one place and form this multicellular structure that allows them to disperse as spores to new environments. And for the purposes of today's talk, uh, what you need to understand about how they do this is that they use something called a sense and secrete signal relay, where they use the small molecule cyclic AMP, both as um, a chemical signal that diffuses extracellularly and that they can sense, as well as as part of the intracellular response to that signal. So when one of these cells senses an extracellular burst in cyclic AMP, they do three main things. Uh, they experience an intracellular spike in cyclic AMP level, which I'm showing as a change in the color of the cell. 
they release their own extracellular burst of cyclic AMP. So they pass that signal along and they chemotax in the direction of that wave. So it, um, which you can often see uh, as a change in cell shape. And individual cells will go through this cycle a number of times um, during this process. So we can see what that looks like on a standard flat homogeneous dish in the lab using this really nice sensor strain for intracellular cyclic AMP. So here cells that have high intracellular cyclic AMP will look more red and with low uh, cyclic AMP will look more yellow. And what you're gonna see is how this initially somewhat uniform population uh, creates these large scale patterns of cyclic AMP signaling and gathers into much larger groups. So at the beginning of this process, you can see these sort of individual bursts of local cyclic AMP activity, but they don't go very far. So these little red flashes. At a certain point, some of those start propagating through the population as almost circular waves. And then some of those waves break and form these self-sustaining spiral centers. Uh, and those spiral centers ultimately localize where these multicellular groups are gonna gather. And so you can see the cells sending that signal outwards and following it inwards um, and gathering into these sort of groups out of this initially relatively homogeneous population. And this highlights one of the really critical things about this system, um, which is that we've studied for a long time and know something about, um, there's still a lot to learn, but we know a fair amount about how this sort of signaling process in this kind of homogeneous environment allows the cells to gather and produce these fruiting body structures. But we also know that in a natural context, they do this in a highly complex three-dimensional variable environment. And so if we could have a system that would allow us to just see inside um, and understand what's going on in there, uh, we would have a really good handle um, to try to address these questions about how the environment affects this process. So to do that, I've been working with a mineral, a naturally occurring mineral called cryolite. And cryolite means ice rock, which reflects its critical property for this purpose, which is that it's refractive index matched to water. So if you put it in an aqueous system, you can see right through the rocks. And you can see that macroscopically here on the right um, in this Eppendorf tube where I've just added water and you can almost look through the cryolite. Um, of course, this only helps us if our cells are actually happy to exist and do their normal development um, when they're surrounded by this rock. And so I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So we're using the same sensor strain again, and then we have an infrared dye that I'm showing in blue so that we can see where these transparent particles are. So the space between the particles looks blue. And we see the cells in at an initially low density with bacterial food so that they'll take on something of a naturalistic configuration before they initiate that aggregation process. And this is a maximum intensity projection in the three different dimensions. So it's hard to see the particles. I'll show you those in a second. But hopefully you can see that the cells are crawling around through this space um, and that they're utilizing in these side views the three-dimensional structure of the microcosm. So they're going up and down. If we zoom out, we can see what the process of development looks like over a period of days. So this is just the infrared channel. You can see this microcosm is packed with those cryolite particles. And um, when we initiate the microcosms, you can see just these few flecks of red and yellow cells. Because there's bacteria in there, they'll grow up to a certain cell density. And then when they run out of food, they'll start signaling to each other. So you can see this red and yellow cyclic AMP wave. And they'll actually complete the process of development and form those fruiting bodies in the system. And they'll do this whole process across a range of conditions. So we can control things about the environment, like the particle size and the fraction of the microcosm that has these particles versus water, as well as the cell density at which this behavior occurs by changing the amount of bacteria we put into the system. And you can see here that um, we can change the cell density at aggregation over at least an order of magnitude. Um, and I think these two handles are really important to understand the system because of the diffusible nature of the signal that coordinates the behavior. So what we're doing now is developing, um, sort of tiling across this space of particle size and cell density to develop a more comprehensive data set. But for now, I wanna highlight a few of the patterns we think we're starting to see. So one is that these patterns vary potentially with both particle size and stage of development. Um, and in particular with these larger particles, we often see um, these arrows are pointing to where some of those aggregation centers are. And we often see them uh, appear to co-localize with some of these particles. In contrast with that, 
at smaller particle sizes and earlier in development, it almost looks like the waves just pass right through. Um, you can see that they're happening in this heterogeneous space, but they look very similar to the spirals I showed you before. And so we're really interested in understanding what sets these kinds of global patterns um, and how they handle these environments. We can also zoom in and look at a more local level. So here we're scanning through different Z planes of the microcosm, and you can see these cells um, are streaming, and I'm, this arrow shows the direction of the wave, so the cells are moving in the opposite direction. Um, and we can see how they're using the three-dimensional space and sort of what shape this wave takes on. And um, if we look at a closer level, I just want to highlight an example where we can see this sort of three-dimensional branching structure in the stream. Here's another example of a similar stage of development, but at a lower density of cells. And you can see again, this wave of cyclic AMP going in one direction and the cells traveling in the other direction. And here's something I think is really interesting is that there are all these rocks in the way, um, but somehow they're sending the signal and also navigating around um, this really complicated space. And we can again, look more closely so here's just three Z planes, um, part of that same video. This is the same rock in three different Z positions. And what you can see is down here on the lower left is the main body of that stream. But up here on the upper right is this group of cells that's migrating towards that stream following the signal. And they seem to have a choice about several different channels that could take them in the right direction. And in the end, they take this path over the top of this particular rock. So I'm also really interested in understanding what shapes these kinds of local interactions for both the signal and the cells. Um, so together we're very, uh, we've developed this, I've developed this system that really allows us to look um, in these naturalistic complex environments at this classic coordinated behavior. And we're varying the cell density, the particle size, and also the properties of the cells themselves using existing mutants for the cyclic AMP pathway, as well as natural isolate strains that differ in some aspects of their signaling to try to understand both global features about what shapes the speed, shape, and size of these waves at a macro scale, as well as these more local interactions um, in terms of how the cells are navigating this environment. And the hope with this project is to try to learn something more general about how these kinds of behaviors are both shaped by and robust to this kind of um, complexity that they encounter in their natural environment. And I just want to highlight that this kind of challenge in this class of problem um, is not unique to this system, but affects a wide variety of really interesting behaviors um, across the natural world. Um, and so something I'm really interested in uh, moving forward is to really understand how the ecology, evolution, and natural history of these systems can help us understand how they work at the scale of how interactions generate these larger patterns and vice versa, right? How understanding how these processes work can inform our understanding of an individual organism's ecology and evolution. Um, and I'd really like to thank everyone here and the members of my lab who've been really supportive um, and if I have time, I'd be excited to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. This was a, uh, this was great talk and a great, a very exciting system. Uh, so again, if anybody has questions, you can uh, raise your hand or like write that in the chat. Uh, I had a more like, curiosity driven. Uh, at the really beginning, you mentioned that this uh, behavior is uh, when uh, uh, they are in a starvation uh, condition uh, and they created the structure to spread spores. Uh, like are, are the spore produced once the structure is done and do you need like an, a specific number of cells to create the structure or the more the better? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, they'll create this structure over many orders of magnitude of cell number. So like the smallest one I know of that's been reported is eight cells. So there are three in the stock and five in the spore cluster, but then they can go up to tens or hundreds of thousands of cells. I think tens of thousands of cells. Yeah. Um, and there's some also interesting work on who gets to be a spore, who gets to be a stock, um, but they migrate around as a group. And then um, some of the spores, some of the cells essentially crawl to the top and then develop into the spores. Yeah. Okay, that, that's very interesting. Okay, uh, I guess for the interest of time, uh, we move on.
And uh, I, I would like, first of all, to thank uh, uh, all the speakers for the evolutionary biology session. But again, uh, as Jasmine mentioned at the very beginning, uh, we have one extra speaker. So I would like to leave uh, uh, to give the mic to Mohini. Uh, she's a postdoc at WashU, and uh, she will be introducing our last speaker for today. Thank you, DJ. As, as you know, this was a wonderful session. Thank you again to all the speakers and the uh, coordinators. For our last talk, we switched to a different field, my favorite, neuroscience. And we hear about, again, another talk about how the brain senses uh, our environment and makes use of the information. Our last speaker today is Clarissa Whitmeyer. Clarissa completed her PhD at Georgia Tech, Emory University with Garrett Stanley, focusing on state-dependent changes in thalamic encoding. Then she made a huge move to Germany at Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine with James Coulet, focusing on the encoding of temperature. Uh, throughout her career, she's uh, had multiple fellowships, an F31 for her PhD, F32 for her postdoc, and also the Human Frontiers Research Program Long-Term Fellowship. So without any more delay, the floor is all yours, Carissa. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. So I am really excited to be here today and talk to you guys about uh, the thalamic encoding of thermosensory information. So um, what I've made for you here is just a graphic in case you're not um, fully engaged in the thalamus. These are the three thalamic nuclei that we'll look at today. Uh, but before we get into that, I just want to talk briefly about perception. So if I show you an image like this, you can immediately sense how it would feel, right? You can feel the cold water on your toes and the warm sun as it hits your skin. You can taste the salt in the air. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that this perception is a construct based on the neural activity that's in your brain. So every aspect of the sensory world that we encounter, that we encode, has to first be sensed by our sensors, our traditional five senses, which then becomes neural activity that then we reconstruct within our brain to create a percept. Now today, what I'm gonna focus on particularly is the skin senses or somatosensation. sensation. So we could change our image here to be maybe a more tactile scene, something that you need to interact with that you can't get all the information visually because we know that somatosensation is multimodal. Uh, we know that somatosensation can include touch, temperature, itch, pain, et cetera. It's, it's very multimodal. And in my thesis work, I primarily worked on the tactile system. And um, in my postdoc, I've transitioned into more of a thermal representation. And there's a lot of reasons for that that I'll get into, but it's basically very interesting to me um, what kind of information we can encode by temperature instead of just touch or temperature independent of touch. So when we think about somatic sensation or thermal encoding, first we can think about the pathway. So we use a mouse model system for a number of reasons. Um, but what you'll see is a lot of commonalities in the pathway from the skin to the brain for the mouse and for the human. Information starts at the primary sensory afferents in the skin, travels through the spinal cord to the thalamus and the cortex. And as I alluded to at the beginning, my real focus and my real emphasis is on the thalamocortical system. I'm really interested in how this information is represented centrally. So the thalamus is a region where almost all sensory information passes through before projecting to the cortex. And I would argue that this thalamocortical circuitry is where the encoding absolutely explodes in complexity. So while we all, while I just presented this to you as the, you know, the sensory drive comes into the thalamus, the thalamus projects to the cortex, but actually the cortex projects back massively to the thalamus. So it's this really highly interconnected loop. And this thalamocortical circuit, like I already said, is, is conserved across senses, but it's also conserved across mammals. Um, and beyond that, it's really important for natural functioning, this connectivity between the two structures. So we know that changes in thalamocortical connectivity are critical for our sleep-wake cycles. And when this dysfunctions, you can have um, these massive state changes, or you could actually go to a vegetative state, have issues with consciousness. And there's also abnormalities in the thalamocortical system that have been implicated in um, disorders like schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorder. So we know that the thalamocortical circuitry, this linking between these two structures is really important. Um, and yet I would argue that cortex is often viewed as the 
perceptual center of the brain. And what I believe is that it's actually a thalamocortical process. And so in my thesis, I spent a lot of time characterizing how the thalamus controls information flow or how it represents um, different aspects of a sensory, pro or sensory um, information and controls what starts at the sensor, through the thalamus, and into the thalamocortical circuit. And in my postdoc, um, I transitioned a little bit to instead of looking at this tactile pathway, but sort of asking what's actually happening in the thermal pathway, which has a lot of different features from tactile encoding. So what I'll talk about today is what's happening in the thalamocortical circuitry for temperature. Now, previous work in the lab has identified multiple cortical representations for temperature. Um, the first being in what we might expect, which is primary somatosensory cortex, and the second being in posterior insular cortex. Now, having multiple cortical representations for a sense is not uncommon. But what's particularly interesting for temperature is that if you look at the thermal representation in S1, you find it's extremely biased to cold. So each neuron within S1, when you provide a cold stimulus to the, to the forepaw, um, you'll get a response in S1. But if you provide a warm stimulus, you will find almost no cells are responsive in S1. In contrast, in posterior insular cortex, we see a much more even representation of cold and warm, where you can get, you can get neurons that respond to warm stimulation of the skin or cold stimulation. And so this sort of created um, this idea that we have these two pathways or two cortical targets in, um, in the temperature pathway. But as you have realized, I'm interested in what's happening in the thalamus. So the first question is quite basic, which is where is temperature represented in the thalamus? So to answer this, we use anatomical tracing. So we injected anatomical tracers into the primary somatosensory cortex and into posterior insular cortex, so into the functionally identified thermally responsive regions. And from this, we were able to do whole brain input mapping for the thermosensory cortex, also output mapping. But for today, I'm just going to focus on what's happening in the thalamus. So what you can see here are three different micrographs. Um, these are images of the thalamus in these mice that have retrograde tracers. To reiterate, the green represents a retrograde tracer that was injected into S1. And the pink represents a retrograde tracer that was injected into posterior insular cortex. So the first thing we can see, if you look at the most rostral segment, or the most rostral slice, is that the VPL is one thalamic nuclei that's been implicated in somatosensory processing. Here we see a very dense labeling, and it's all green. This would indicate that this region, the rostral region of VPL, is projecting exclusively to primary somatosensory cortex. If we look at the caudal region and the POT, what we see is everything is pink. So everything is projecting to the posterior insular cortex. And in these intermediate levels, in POM and again in another slice of VPL, what we can see is that the S1 and PIC projecting thalamic neurons are separate populations. We found almost no co-expressing cells and that they are actually spatially segregated. And we also found this across mice. So this is a um, contour plot across five injected animals that show that all of the S1 projecting cells are located more rostrally and the PIC projecting shells are more caudal. And so what we think is that this has identified perhaps two parallel pathways, one going from the rostral regions of VPL and PO and another going from the caudal regions of VPL and PO to POT. So after identifying anatomically where the thermal information could be represented, we asked, how is it actually represented here? <clears throat> and to answer this, we used high density electrode recordings um, from each of the thalamic nuclei. So here we're using electrode arrays known as neuropixels. Uh, neuropixels have hundreds of contact sites per electrode. So when you insert this single shank, you can record from on the order of hundreds of neurons simultaneously. And what we did was record from the VPL, the POM, the POT in the awake mouse while providing thermal stimuli to the contralateral forepaw. So now if I replace this schematic with the 3D rendering that you saw before, here I've colored the VPL to be cyan, the POM to be pink, and the POT to be orange. And this is a reconstruction of each electrode track that we um, have made. So each one of these black lines indicates another experiment with another probe. And from this, we've recorded on the order of 4,000 um, thalamic neurons. Now, as you can expect, this data set is incredibly um, complex. So I'll only touch on a, a corner of it today. 
but I'd be happy to take questions about it um, afterwards. So this is basically what the data looks like. So we insert these probes. And first, after the end of the experiment, during the histology, we reconstruct the probe track. Those are those black lines that I showed you in the last figure. So on the far left here, you see this um, colored column. This is indicating which contacts are in which region of the brain. So CA1 would mean those contacts are in hippocampus, all the way down to at the bottom, ZI is zona inserta, which is an inhibitory nuclei. And um, the region that we're particularly interested in is PO. This is where we saw the anatomical labeling. And then we can look at the neural activity of these cells. So in these raster plots, each gray circle here represents a single spike from a single neuron plotted by the depth along the probe. Um, in the left column, we have the response to a cooling stimulus. So this is a 10 degree step from 32 down to 22 degrees Celsius. And on the right, we have a warming stimulus going from 32 degrees to 42 degrees. So in all cases, every stimulus we provide is an innocuous thermal stimulus and 10 degree step is the largest stimulus that we provide. Um, and what you can see here is that in the region of PO, which I'll just highlight here, we see this density of um, the gray dots or the density of spikes that occurs when the stimulus is happening, which indicates that we're getting a stimulus evoked response. So this is just a single trial, just to give you an idea of what the data actually looks like. But we can pool this across all of the neurons. So what you're looking at now is the um, evoked response to cold stimulation in blue or warm stimulation in red. And across every single neuron that we recorded in the PO. So in the left hand column, you can see there are um, many, many cells responding to cold and there are fewer responding to warm. There's obvious differences in the temporal dynamics, um, which we can go into in detail, but the most striking difference that we found was that if you just compute a thermal tuning index where we say how many cells are responding to cool only, how many to cool warm, and how many to warm only, what we see is a massive bias towards a cool representation. And so we returned to our original um, anatomy data where we said, okay, we think the Rostra regions of VPL and PO are projecting to S1, and S1 has a cool bias. And we think the rostral and, or sorry, the caudal regions of VPL, POM, and POT are projecting to PIC, where you have a warm, cool representation. So we use this um, to segregate our regions. Again, the S1 projecting are the rostral, and PIC projecting are the caudal. And what we found is that in these rostral regions, there's a massive overrepresentation of cold. So there's very little warm representation here. And these are the, the anatomically identified regions that project to S1, where we also see only a cool representation. In the caudal regions and in POT, what we see is that there is still an overrepresentation of cool, but the representation of warm is significantly larger. And these are projecting to a region that has a robust representation of warm. So while the thalamic representation isn't um, as even as what we saw in cortex, we think that this does suggest um, or present a baseline, I guess, for two parallel pathways. One from the Rostra regions of VPL and PO to S1, that's primary function seems to be cold encoding. And another pathway that's going from these caudal regions in the POT towards the PIC, um, which seems to have a more equal representation of cold and warm. Now, this is just um, one aspect of this data so far, but what I'm interested in doing in my own work in the future and uh, what we're doing is the next immediate steps for some of this work is actually defining the information transfer in the thalamocortical circuit. So one piece of information that I left off is that there's local processing within the thalamus. So there's another nucleus, an inhibitory nucleus called the reticular thalamus that has local connectivity within the thalamus. And so the first thing that I'm most interested in doing is identifying local thalamic processing. To do this um, with another postdoc in the lab, we've developed a primary sensory afferent uh, preparation where we can record the inputs to the thalamus. And we've recorded simultaneously from hundreds of thalamic neurons at a time and are now studying the connectivity patterns and the synchrony between these. I'm also interested in how this information actually transmits to the cortex. So which features are critical for effective representation in cortex and which are not. And last, I really want to know how the cortex is capable of shaping the activity within the thalamus. And so this is my longer term goals and plans. 
Um, but at this point, I'll, I'll wrap up and just say thank you to the people who are involved in this work. The electrophysiology work is done in equal collaboration with a very talented post or PhD student, Tobias Leva. And the anatomy work was led by uh, Phil Bokiniak, another postdoc in the lab. And a big thanks to the Poulet Lab, who's been um, very helpful in all of this work, as well as my funding agencies, and of course, Leading Edge for this platform to share my work. So thank you. Thank you so much, Clarissa. That was awesome. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, Clarissa, if you could just end the presentation. Yes, you can raise your hands or put it in the chat, whatever is easier. If there are no questions from the audience, I had actually two questions for you, Clarissa. So mm -hmm. the first, I am actually really impressed with the kind, the way you're studying this, because usually when you want to study connectivity and understand um, neural processing, people take anatomical approaches or single cells, and, and the idea is to do that classical way. But you're really going into a big question, this population and coding, and how do you know certain features of this whole population code transmits to other regions. So in that regard can you give me a little bit of information on how much of these thalamus to cortex connections are excitatory or inhibitory and what do you think are some of these um, features that are being transmitted that's my first question the second question mm -hmm. is i'm really amazed with these two parallel pathways and what is the ethological relevance of having two parallel pathways can you just comment on that mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll start with the first because the second one will be totally um, postulating. But so for the first one, um, I didn't go into this in detail, but there's a distinct connectivity between the cells that are going into the thalamus and the cells that are going out. So um, I did my PhD in the whisker pathway. And so in the vibrissa pathway, it's believed that a single thalamic neuron receives inputs from one to three neurons. So these really strong driver inputs are coming in from the brainstem to the thalamus, okay, so one to three. I mean, they're getting tons of inputs from everywhere. I just mean the sensory drive. But a given cortical neuron is integrating over on the order of 85 thalamic neurons. So one idea in the thalamocortical circuit is that what's really important is spike timing. And what's really important is the synchronous activation of these populations of neurons. And so in the, um, in the thermal pathway, this is an idea that I'm actually actively exploring right now is when we do the behavioral work, I didn't show all the behavioral work, but we also do a ton of perceptual tasks and detection tasks to see what the animals can detect. They're actually quite good at detecting both warm and cold, even though cold is much better represented than warm. And so one idea of how that could be possible could be due to the synchronization parameter within the pathway. And that if warm is equally synchronized, but it's just more variable due to the transduction or translation process at the periphery, then, um, perhaps that could underlie why we can still do this task. Um, there's other answers to this question too. I mean, I think another big one is in the thalamus, I mentioned just briefly that there's differences in the state dependent encoding and the thalamus is notorious for having two different firing modes, the tonic firing mode and the burst firing mode. And um, in the burst firing mode, we think that's a way to drive a really strong stimulus to cortex. And for example, that the burst would be very good for detection style tasks, the presence of the stimulus whereas a tonic firing mode will likely maintain more detailed features of the stimulus. So this is when we start to get into more like information encoding um, properties. And it's where we're going. It's just, it's turned out uh, 4,000 neurons is actually quite a lot. It's the data set I dreamed of and maybe didn't expect uh, in my PhD. Um, but your second question of that was about the, um, basically you, why. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we hypothesize about this a lot. so. My opinion is that the somatosensory pathway is really for tactile um, object handling, that realistically we're warm bodied creatures. And so most of the objects we interact with are cold, colder than us. So it makes more sense to me that we would have a finer resolution for cold. Um, why it is that warm isn't represented at all that I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I have a working hypothesis that it's related to the synchrony and we're testing that in a separate process, in a separate project, but that's um, gonna take some time to, to figure out. But you know, just for comparison on this like ethological relevance, like in uh, snakes, they studied in boa constrictors and found that they're the exact opposite of us. They only have warm sensors and not cold. So 
maybe there's something to do with just what we expect from mammals. Um, that's a long-winded answer, sorry. Well, that was excellent. I, I feel like I want to just sit and have a couple of hours of coffee conversation with you. But in the interest of time, we won't do it on Zoom today. I will just give over the floor again to Avicii for closing remarks. Thank you, Clarissa, for the lovely talk. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, to close, uh, I would like to thank again, Jasmine and Mohini. It was very fun uh, to co-host this session with you guys. And then I would like to thank all the speakers. Uh, it was uh, uh, very uh, beautiful to hear uh, all your stories uh, and your talks. And uh, you guys uh, will do great. And you're working on very interesting science. And then uh, I would like to remind uh, the audience uh, that uh, we have the last uh, session from this uh, uh, Leading Edge Symposium this year. It's uh, Friday, the same time as today, and it's going to be developmental biology. It's a great lineup of speakers, so please uh, connect and join us there. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>